they've been saying through the day, is this thing on? There we go. Okay, now we're on. Uh, how was lunch? Great? Yes. Thank you, Morningstar. <laughs> Tremendous. And isn't it nice to be in an event where all the food is not just good food, but good food? So what a, nice, uh, what a nice situation this is. I'm Brian Cooley, editor-at-large at CNET. Uh, nice to be with many of you again, and a lot more of you than last year. What a nice growth we've had here in the conference from year one last year. And this is a really interesting turn we make here at the middle of the day. We have such a strong investor and business-savvy flavor here at the Good Food Conference. This is a central part of it. We've been talking so much about the amazing companies that have become bulwarks in the area of plant-based and clean meat food. You know, a year ago, some of us were still scratching our heads that what do you mean you isolate something from peas and rice? We take that for granted now, right? We have all these major names from, from, from Kroger to Morningstar to Impossible to Beyond and so many others that are now part of the national dialogue. And yet we're always looking for what's next. And I think the way Bruce put it this morning in his opening keynote was, was the tone of the conference. This is a floats all boats situation. This is about succeeding together. It's not a zero-sum game. It's about a lot of support across different layers of the market approach, the product vertical, the technologies that are involved to create these things and get them to market and get them to scale and get them consistent and get them priced right. So we have so many interesting interlocking teams here and you've just got a vibe that you don't find in a lot of other sectors. No, you're at a very special moment in time and amongst a very special cadre of people. So with that, I'd like to th get your mind thinking forward about the next group of innovators, the ones who may be the big names in a year or two from now as we come back to the conference each time. We're gonna get together with six startups. Each one is seeking to be that next giant, that next beyond, that next morning star, uh, that next whoever it may be who's going to become the one that is steering the industry with something we couldn't imagine even a year or two before. And you know, there's an interesting difference. Uh, entrepreneurs, as all the investors in the room know, they all look a little bit out there at first. Until they succeed, they all look crazy because they disregard the status quo, because they believe in something that isn't even on a blank whiteboard yet, that they may have created from ingredients you think can't be that. And we're about to see six people who believe very much to the contrary, things that can be that they are already doing and on the cusp of bringing the market in many, uh, in many ways right now. So we're going to have our pitches. Each one will give you a five-minute pitch. Then we're going to have about three or four minutes afterwards in which I'm going to Q&A them on the top points that came up from their pitch. I'll be your proxy, so I'll try to do a good job and catch the most interesting items in there from each one of their categories, and they're all quite different and diverse. So let's get started now with the first of our six innovative startups. If you'll welcome from Rebellious Foods, Christy Legali. Good afternoon. Climate scientists tell us we have less than 12 years to mitigate the worst impacts of climate change, and significant meat reduction is a necessary step. However, half the US meat industry is chicken, and so we need to take a moment to ask ourselves, what is our plan to reduce chicken? My name is Christy Legali. I'm the founder and CEO of Rebellious Foods. We make delicious, juicy, and affordable plant-based chicken nuggets, patties, and strips. We have a philosophy. If it looks, cooks, and tastes like a nugget, then it's a nugget. Only our nugget saves time, money, and the world. That's because we replace factory farmed chicken nuggets, patties, and strips in food service. It's a $40 billion industry. Our nuggets are 100% plant-based, they have significantly less saturated fat and sodium, and have no cholesterol, antibiotics, and hormones, and they're made from wheat and soy. I'd like to introduce you to Chef Zach at Swedish Hospital in Capitol Hill in Seattle. He would like to replace meat in his cafeteria, and plant-based meat would be the easiest. In fact, he's not alone. The unmet immediate need for plant-based meat in the food service market is over $1 billion a year in schools, hospitals, correctional facilities, corporate cafeterias, and higher education institutions. And that's what we do. We effectively compete on cost and volume with factory farmed chicken to serve our large food service customers. Because we know that plant-based meat is not yet competing with meat. 
In the United States, we produce over 105 billion pounds of animal meat every year, and yet we only produce about one-fifth of 1% 1 of that volume in plant-based meat. And plant-based meat continues to be about two to five times the cost of animal meat, making it cost prohibitive for most Americans. But let's take a moment to talk about why we focus specifically on chicken nuggets. For the last 50 years, Americans have increasingly preferred ready-to-heat and serve chicken products. And now, further processed chicken, such as chicken nuggets, patties, and strips, make up about half the US chicken industry. But we also have to take a moment and to ask, how is chicken so cheap? The answer is manufacturing technology. Since the 1960s, the US chicken industry has automated and mechanized the production and slaughter of chicken, making it one of the most efficient production systems in the US today. So how do we compete with this? We do exactly the same thing. At Rebellious Foods, we design novel production equipment and automated production methods in order to make our products at the same price, taste, and preparation as chicken, only ours are healthier. And we install that new equipment in innovative new production facilities capable of producing over 30 million pounds per year at capital costs lower than the cost of a chicken processing facility. And by standardizing that production facility and replicating it in new locations, we're capable of establishing the infrastructure of plant-based meat production. This is how we essentially compete with factory farmed chicken. And while most plant-based meat products are sold as a premium, we sell our products and maybe can capture 5% of the chicken industry. Our products are sold at nearly the same price as chicken, and we can capture a much larger segment of the market. And we know this works. Remember Chef Zach at Swedish Hospital? He now serves our chicken nuggets at the same cost as animal meat chicken. And our nuggets are a huge success with kids and are now menued for school lunch programs in Seattle this fall. Even more exciting, we recently won a startup competition hosted by Compass Group, the world's largest food service provider. We are now for the opportunity to serve many of their clients. Now our rebellious nuggets are in the biggest name corporate cafeterias in the Pacific Northwest. So now it's time to us for us to grow. In 29 days, we are opening up our first proprietary production facility. We'll be starting the development of our prototype equipment and prototyping it, and we're hiring talented new staff. All of this is led by me, Christy Legali. I'm a former Boeing engineer and holder of five patents in manufacturing technology. And Christy Middleton, who spent the last 10 years developing a nationwide program to help large institutions reduce their meat consumption. In fact, we're now a team of 12, spanning engineering, food science, logistics, and production. And we would love for you, we would love for you to join us. So ladies and gentlemen, start your dipping sauces. Let's get rebellious for our health, for our animals, and for the planet. Thank you. Uh, now, Christy's a little modest. You may have heard she kind of just blurted right over the fact that she's a former Boeing engineer. <laughs> and I find this very interesting in a business where, as we walk around the exhibit halls here, there's a ton of process that is a major challenge in the area of plant-based meats and, of course, in clean meats. How much of an advantage is that? How much of that work and experience are you really putting together on these production plans you're talking about? So one of the things to remember about any product that you make is that a product is defined by what you want it to do and also how it's made. So it's literally the other half of the equation. So what we're doing is we're really trying to establish a new infrastructure to solve that other half of the equation. You know, we've been making plant-based meat in the United States for 120 years, mm. and yet we really haven't come to anywhere near the scale of animal meat. We're trying to change that because the missing equation, or the missing piece of the equation, is actually manufacturing. A lot of companies in this sector are afraid of what consumers will think of them using wheat and soy. 
You're not afraid of wheat and soy. Why are those the right ingredients to have in your mix? Well, first of all, a lot of people don't realize that the 98,000 school districts in the United States, for an alternative meat, only soy is accepted by the US government. Mm. So we actually have to use soy. But beyond that, we do believe it is a valuable product, a complete protein. And wheat and soy offers us the opportunity to offer products that can be offered today at the near to the same price as chicken. And given we only have 12 years, we have to do something about it right now. Okay, sidebar, how do you get the coating, the breading so crispy? <laughs> you guys try these things? They're so crispy you can't even eat them quietly. <laughs> How'd you do that? Uh, so that's an interesting story. As much <laughs> as you can share with a thousand of your best friends. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting you say that because chicken is such a unique product because it really, um, it's, it ensures that you kind of have all of the moisture inside the cells mm -hmm. itself. Our manufacturing process replicates that for plant-based meat, and hence you end up with a product you can easily bread and easily crisp up without having to worry about it becoming soggy. You did a good job on having two different textures in one small space. Thank nice you. Work. Okay, Christy, let's review Christy Legale from Rebellious <laughs> Thank Foods. You. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> crunch, crunch, crunch. Okay, now let's segue from one craveable food category to another one, arguably the most craveable. I mean, this guy's, this guy's really a pusher. He's out there, he has the gall to go out in one of the halls there and make bacon. That's not fair when everyone else is around you making anything other than bacon. I mean, nothing so intoxicating as that smell, that taste, and that look when it's done right. A lot of bacon doesn't look terribly much like bacon, but that's what they're trying to solve here uh, as we take a look at what's uh, going on with Hooray Foods. Please welcome founder Sri Artham. Good afternoon, everyone. And I'm just really excited to welcome you to San Francisco, which is my hometown, and I um, hope you guys enjoy your visit here. So my name is Sri Artham, as Brian mentioned. I'm the founder of Hooray Foods. And this is my first time pitching in front of an audience this large, so I need your help warming me up. Yeah, oh, that's great. I mean, that, that's fantastic. Okay, one more exercise. I'm gonna ask you guys a question, and if you agree, you're gonna put your arms in the air and you're gonna yell hooray, all right? You're gonna yell hooray. So, who, what would you say if someone offered you the delicious, crispy, chewy, plant-based bacon? What would you say? Hooray! Exactly. So you know two things now. You know what my company's called, Hooray Foods, and we make bacon. So you can stop listening for the next four minutes because you've got to know everything you need to know. Um, but let me tell you a little bit more for those who are interested. So you guys all know this. Um, animal agriculture is the number two source of greenhouse gas emissions in the world. And um, if you look at the ranking, pigs are the number two in the U.S. After, uh, after cows, tied roughly with chickens for greenhouse gas emissions. So that compelled me to do something about this problem. And the other thing about pigs is that they're really smart, and they kind of have a social capability that's similar to dogs. I have a dog at home, so just the idea of us eating this many pigs is something that just seems a little tragic to me, and something I think we can do better about. So when you start looking at a pig, when I was trying to solve this problem, I looked at what are the most expensive cuts. And I remember hearing in a podcast a few years ago that if you could solve, if you could remove the market for pork bellies, you could remove the market for pigs. Pork bellies kind of make the pig market. So being a most expensive cut of a pork belly, sorry, of the pig, that seemed like a natural starting point. And kind of as Brian mentioned, like everyone gets excited about bacon. So I wanted to start with bacon. Um, and compared to say like hamburgers, where I think the best plant-based burgers are really close to a real uh, beef burger, bacon I think still has some room to grow between the best plant-based bacons and, and, um, and what we, I think if you want to really get a meat eater switch, what we need to where we need to be. So I decided to create a bacon that was tastes, handles, looks, um, and feels in your mouth just like real bacon. It's soy-free, gluten-free. I've worked in sustainable food for most of the past decade, so I've been thinking about this product from beginning to end. So for example, most of our ingredients are organic. Our coconut oil will be fair trade. Um, we just started, I just started doing R&D in February from in my kitchen, and in a couple of months got into a few stores, so we're working out of a commercial kitchen right now. Um, and later this year, we'll be, working, sorry, the next few months, we'll be working on manufacturing so we can start selling more bacon. Um, and in terms of go to market, as I said, we're in a couple of restaurants here in San Francisco, and we're going to focus on food service for a while. It turns out that most people eat bacon out of home in restaurants and, that, and, and cafeterias and that sort of thing at, than at home. Um, and, you know, 
people often ask us about future products. It turns out bacon is a huge market. So in the US alone, bacon's about a $7 billion market. And globally, it's almost a $60 billion market. So we think if we can crack bacon, we can actually have a pretty big, impactful company. So we do think about what might come next. And one of the things we think about is using our same process for deli meats and other cuts of pork that, so we can really get after the whole, the, the whole um, I was going to say whole hog, but it's like a bad pun. <laughs> Unintended pun, sorry. Um, and you know, the most important thing in any company's success is the team around them. And I've been blessed with meeting some amazing people to support me. Um, some of you will see Sam Littman around. We're sampling bacon today at 4 o'clock in the Ralston room, so go check it out if you want to try some. Um, Trishna was a, 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 in R&D at Ripple. Dan Malik, Dan Altshuler, you guys have probably seen speak earlier this morning. And an, um, another great VC friend, Jamie Dean. So we're on an amazing journey. We're always looking for great investors, customers, and, um, and people to join our team. So if you have any suggestions, if you'd like to join our journey, we'd love to welcome you on that path. Thank you. Do the hooray thing again. Oh, yeah. Who was, who's excited about bacon, plant-based bacon? Hooray! hooray. Okay. You guys are great. <laughs> uh, Tell me this, you, uh, you come from a food background in the industry, but not in literally inventing and making foods, right? Correct. More in the chain and the process and supply. I'm always surprised, I think a lot of people who uh, perhaps aren't in this industry directly are amazed when, like you said, you went into your kitchen in February and started making what looks like an awfully good analog for real bacon, the best perhaps we've seen. How does that happen in someone's kitchen from scratch? I'll say two things. One is the Good Food Institute's been an awesome influence on me. So they have a massively on, uh, M -O -O -C, something massively online something course mm -hmm. that teaches you how to do these sorts of things. <laughs> and I recommend it. Go check out that course. Mm. The second, I think it's also an advantage to not know what I was doing. I have no culinary background, so, so no constraints. It helped me just think really big and broadly. Very interesting. Now, uh, you have a very strong emphasis in your presentation, and I think when we've talked briefly in your whole company ethic about uh, going after the animal welfare piece of this. Yes. Uh, and not every company is perhaps confident in that message, saying, you know, consumers are going to hand you your hat when you use one of the V words. I'm going to go work environmental and personal health. Those right. are safe, right? Everyone loves that, or at least gives them lip service. What's the origins and the reason for uh, a pretty strong message here around animals and around pigs in particular? Great question. So certainly within the industry, I think you guys all understand why we're doing this. Though when I think when we go to market, we might have a health forward approach, because that's the way at least most Americans are thinking about sure. plant-based meats. Um, and especially bacon, right? It has an image bacon. of being very toxic, if you will. Exactly. And there are all these reports about processed meats being carcinogenic. So that I think that's our angle when we go to market. Um, for me, it was uh, when the campfires hit here in California uh, in November last year. Was, for three days, you couldn't walk outside in San Francisco, and there was just too much smog in the air. And that was the moment that made me switch from social issues in our food system to environmental and, and animal welfare. Oh, interesting. And you're doing with a food that tastes smoky. So there's yeah. something for you. I don't know what to make of that. All right. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank, let's hear it for Sri Artham. Thank you very much. Excellent. Nice work. Told you these would all be very diverse in terms of where they're going and the motivations behind them as well. I love this part of the conference. Uh, uh, everything here is great, but this is one of their favorites. Uh, let's go now to uh, a double header I've got for you. We'll have two presenters here, two co-founders. I think it's the only one that we have this way today. Uh, please welcome now from Better Nature, uh, founders Christopher Kong and co-founder Amadeus Anand. All right. Hi, I am Chris, the CEO and co-founder of Better Nature. And I'm Ando, the CTO and co-founder of Better Nature. At Better Nature, we make protein the better way. As we all know, people all over the world are becoming increasingly concerned about the impact of meat consumption. However, whilst the plant-based market was booming, we felt it wasn't prioritizing people's key motivator, health. In a study published last year, it was found the concerns about cost and health are the main drivers of the reduction of meat consumption. But most plant-based companies have been using texturized vegetable proteins, which, in order to mimic the texture of meat, require the use of a long list of binding and gelling agents that are not recognizable by consumers. As a result, there's a growing voice of concern around the use of such ingredients. Six in 10 consumers are looking for all natural food products, and 41% of consumers are looking for plant-based food products without any artificial ingredients. So what if I told you that there exists a delicious, nutritious, and all-natural food ingredient 
that's able to mimic the protein content and texture of meat without any artificial or ultra-processed ingredients. That food ingredient is tempeh. Tempeh is a delicious, nutritious, and all-natural fermented food ingredient originated in Indonesia 300 years ago. It is made using tempeh fermentation, a low-cost food processing technology that can increase the protein content of any bean, nut, and legume by 20%, and decrease the fat content by 40%. Our tempeh has similar quantity and quality of protein as beef, all with a carbon footprint that is just 45 times smaller. It can also be used in all sorts of dishes. And this technology of tempeh fermentation is still extremely nascent, but there's plenty of scope for us to innovate and create defensible IP, which is exactly what we're doing. At Better Nature, we're the world's first food tech company that focuses on tempeh fermentation and innovation. We're creating proprietary methods and non-GMO fermentation cultures to enhance the nutritional and sensory qualities of our tempeh. So far, we have created a novel method to half the fermentation time, just 18 hours. And we're also developing our tempeh to be a complete source of nutrition, starting with vitamin B12. We're currently in the process of launching four meat alternative products, a bacon, a mince, lupin tempeh, and soy tempeh, which will be in UK retailers by the end of this year. We're also excited about new alternative meat products, such as the Better Burger. It's wholesome, all natural, and tastes great. It has 15 grams of protein, 6 grams of fiber. It's all thanks to the tempeh fermentation miracle. And we will start by selling via premium UK retailers and e-commerce platforms to quickly establish our brand before moving into large UK multiples after that. And luckily for us, there is no better place in the world to start our type of business than the UK. Last year, the UK launched more vegan products than any other nation, and the domestic meat-free market is expected to exceed a billion dollars next year. And you know, with the team that we have, we believe that we are in the best position to take tempeh to the mainstream and to create foods that are better for people, better for the planet, and better for animals. I graduated from the University of Oxford with a master's in biochemistry, and prior to graduating, worked in McKinsey. And Ando is currently wrapping up his PhD on tempeh fermentation at UMass Amherst. He has won 31 awards for his work on the technology, making him a leader in the field. Since our founding just 11 months ago, we have won two international food tech competitions and were rated the best startup of the cohort of the ProVeg Incubator Program based in Berlin. We are now a finalist of the European Institute of Technologies Food Accelerator Program and are looking to raise $2 million to invest in further R&D, product development, marketing, and manufacturing. We want to continue to develop proprietary technology to make our tempeh a complete source of nutrition, such that our customers don't need to worry about taking dietary supplements if they consume our products. And we want to establish ourselves as the leading tempeh brand in the UK, to launch the Better Burger, and to establish a manufacturing facility to significantly increase our margins and our capacity. We're better nature, and we make protein the better way. Thank you. Thank you. Now, you guys are working in a, with a base material that is, like you say, uh, 300 years old. Correct. Very old one that is well known. In an industry where there's an awful lot of love for having a new technique, a new mm. base, a new way of getting there, take it apart, reconstruct it. How will you make sure that your message doesn't seem a little bit dated when you're bringing out tempeh, which people have seen a lot over decades in their life? So, should I answer this? Yep. <laughs> What's new under the sun in tempeh? Let's put it that way. How exactly. That clear? So, I guess, in a way, we are not producing, for example, a tempeh burger. We're producing the better burger. It just so happens to be based on tempeh. And the reason why tempeh is such an amazing food ingredient is because during that fermentation process, which is what we're focusing on in our R&D, you know, that fermentation process is, in fact, I guess, our binding and gelling agent. So you don't need to use all these long, you know, all these ingredients that are not recognizable to consumers to create meat-like products. Yeah, and uh, if I... 
might so. add a little bit. <laughs> like, if you would like to stop by during the networking breaks, we have samples, for example, better bacon. In Indonesia, where I grew up in, where every day people would eat tempeh, they would call it fried tempeh, tempeh goreng. But if we educate the market like that, it's like, it's negative, it's fried foods. But if it's a better bacon, it's bacon, it's indulgence. So they don't mind if it's fried. So that probably gave a clear example. You mentioned growing up in Indonesia, Singapore roots, no, right? Hong Kong. Hong Kong. Yeah. So you guys have this strong Asian understanding of a very vast, vibrant market there. What lessons do you think you can take from that part of the world that you've seen in food trends, acceptance of new ones, and that sort of thing, and use that in the US or the UK market? What are, their, what are the learnings from there that you think, you look around the US go, why aren't they thinking of this? Yep, so I think sometimes we forget that the science is a collection of knowledge that on top of what people have done research in. And sometimes we forget there are plenty of new knowledge in the nature that has not been researched. So what we are doing is I'm reflecting on my experience growing up in Indonesia. There are many local wisdoms that we can see just like Tempe. It's ahead of our time. We have not understood it yet. So our approach in better nature is we really respect the nature. We respect that technology is derived from the nature. That is only a small part of what nature knows. So we want to respect that and try to use that to deliver what the market is looking for, what people want to look for. And it's like the better nature, what's the, the better nature in ourself is looking for. And that's why the company is well-named. Please thank the founders of Better Nature. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Good work. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's see. We've uh, gone through some nuggets, some bacon, a uh, burger, and some other sorts of products that will be coming from that. Now let's get to what is somewhat... Uh, Another holy grail, if you will. There are so many in this sector. But there's been an awful lot of buzz lately, through 2019 certainly, about getting into the area of cuts, of things that are more like muscle uh, slices and cuts of product. A very difficult area to achieve by anyone's estimation. But uh, one of our presenters who's going in that direction is going to be talking to us next. And the idea here is to see what his future vision is uh, from a small startup to go after what even some of the largest companies are having a challenge explaining or at least getting people to believe they can accomplish. So please welcome from Nova Meat, CEO and founder Giuseppe Shanti. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Giuseppe Scionti. I'm CEO and founder at Novamit. I'm a former professor in bioengineering and tissue engineering. So what we do at Novamit is we develop plant-based plant -based, microstrated fibrous meat. So it's not ground meat, but it's fibrous meat instead. So as he said, we try to get the whole muscle. And we do that because everybody knows here, we have seen a lot of this, but I'm always surprised when I see we are not only double digits in annual growth rate, but UBS says it's almost double of online food delivery in the next 10 years, and almost double of farming 4.0. So what we do is we try to use tissue engineering strategies, so cell-based meat strategies, but to create a plant-based meat substitute. And uh, we do that because we think there is advantages in both strategies, right? We want to get to the, to, to the authenticity of cell-based meat, but we want to get the time and cost efficiency of plant-based meat. So we apply these tissue engineering strategies, and we want to get to the taste that, for example, Beyond or Impossible have very, uh, very well achieved. And we want to use the same ingredients they use, but transform that into something with the texture of fibrous meat, like uh, whole muscle. So uh, we try to, uh, to use these tissue engineering strategies so that we can get also the appearance at the three-dimensional level and also at the microstructure internal to this muscle. And uh, these words I borrow from uh, the Director of Science and Technology at uh, Good Food Institute, David Welch, thank you, because uh, he explains, and uh, we agree that uh, low moisture and high moisture extrusion works well for some application, but there is a need for alternatives, especially if you want to create something that is not soy extrusion or wheat gluten extrusion. Huh? If you want to create pea extrusion and mix some proteins, uh, you need to have an alternative uh, technology. And our technology allows plant-based meat manufacturers so we give that, them this technology to create different textures and use a variety of ingredients. 
So what we do is in tissue engineering, when I was a professor, I was studying the histology of the tissues, and we study the cells, how they interact in their matrix, and uh, we, create to, we create models, how to uh, imitate these structures, and then we create three-dimensional structures, so you have the microstructure internal and the macrostructure, and we create these models to get to the appearance, the taste and the texture at the same time. We have an international patent. We just applied for the PCT application, so the international um, process. Of, um, we want to be patent is the focal composition, the plant-based composition, the microextrusion process. Our technology is not about 3D printing. Our, our technology is about microextrusion, right? This means that it can be scalable. Uh, it, it means it can be scaled up without the need of a 3D printer. So uh, we patented the process and the composition. This is our team, and I announced now. I see that uh, TechCrunch is now on the. Homepage in techcrunch.com, Jonathan Schieber has just published that we raised the seed round with New Crop Capital. So it's published right now, and it's on the homepage of TechCrunch. And they are our new partners. Then is our strategic advisors. We have a very strong IP and legal advisor, and we have a team that is growing. Now we have food engineer and manager of strategy and operations, Kristen and Joan. So we have been very lucky because uh, because we do it with a printer, we have been uh, uh, the first movers there, and we have been on many different uh, newspapers. I was selected as one as the nine innovators to watch in 2019 by Smithsonian Institute, and uh, given uh, TED conferences, I've been talking in the European Parliament and the UN meetings, because the people not only want to create whole muscle, they want to have customizable products. If you want to have plant-based meat, it needs to be customizable, and to customize it, you need to know um, how to create this using tissue engineering, and who best uh, than tissue engineers are able to create tissues like muscle. All right, so we are now talking to space agencies also, and always every day with the Good Food Institute, uh, with the Michelin star restaurants, and even with the FAO to try to get different projects, even humanitarian purposes. And now, to end, I will show you just a video during the Q&A, and I'm happy afterwards if you want to contact me and know about the business model, how we apply this technology and give this technology to plant-based meat manufacturers, how we can apply this technology to cell-based meat, so provide the scaffolding technology so that they can see the cells on top and have a three-dimensional structure, and about the next investment round. So you can contact me. There is my mail here. And now Very good. for Except questions. Very good. And... Uh, we're going to run this while we talk. This will give us some illustration of the process right. and the product, right? That's correct. While we're talking, you're very process and technology forward in what you're doing. Tell me about how microextrusion and 3D printing relate in your vision. Right. So 3D printing is my way. And we started there because I was using bio printing strategies. As you see here, I was doing tissues in the lab for human applications, so to create right. organs and tissues for human applications. And I thought, why can't I use this for, uh, to create meat mm -hmm. instead? So I do that with a 3D printer because it's easy. I, I can customize and prepare different textures and different uh, variety of ingredients. And then when we want to scale up, uh, I thought that 3D printing was the, the great way to demonstrate that our, my microextrusion technology I developed some years ago now, a couple of years ago now, can be scaled up with all their machines. Okay, so the microextrusion, what are we seeing here? This is 3D printing. Right, this okay. is our 3D printer. And how will microextrusion differ from that if we were to see it happening? Is right. it a, it's a different apparatus? Yes. No, uh, the, what we use now is this, as you explained uh, mm -hmm. uh, very well, and then now uh, the microextrusion at the large scale will be, I cannot disclose uh, very much about this technology because the patent will be not public yet, All right. right? But what happens is uh, we try to adapt the technology so that the infrastructures that plant-based meat and meat manufacturers already use, we want to adapt that so that we can use the same infrastructure and help them in this transition to create whole pieces of uh, plant-based meat. All right, and uh, what are we seeing there? What kind of a <laughs> cut is that? Right, what, what they see is Barcelona. What we see here is um, the machine. Um, but uh, oh, yeah. what we're seeing is we try to... That's called a seagull. 
<laughs> That's called the seagull cut. And yes. Barcelona is very nice if you want to visit. No. Yes, lovely. Yeah, our place. laboratories. What we what we're seeing there is that uh, we order these microfibers in the same way as uh, the muscular tissue is built. Mm -hmm. Not exactly the same way. We try to create a simplified model. We create a hierarchical and anisotropic structure so that these microfilaments create similar similarly to uh, fibrous. Uh, um, uh, the muscular fibers. Yes. Inside of them, there is actin and myosin, so we order the plant-based nanoproteins in the same direction as we want to create the texture and use the same ingredients that normally high moisture and low moisture extruders cannot use. So, for example, imagine to put a beyond uh, uh, paste, beyond meat paste that you want to transform into a, a piece of stick. You can't do that with the, the, the actual technology now because right. it's, uh, it's harsh, it's high temperature, it's high pressure, it's uh, depending on the, the technology, it's high or lower moisture, but we think we can, uh, we can do it. Very good. Let's hear it for Giuseppe Shanti, please, from Nova Meat. Thank you. Thank you, Giuseppe. Very good. All right, let's move on. We have uh, two of our showcase presenters left. Uh, the next one coming up, uh, we're going to hear from Blair Crichton here in a moment of Corona, uh, doing some interesting things with, starting with, and they're at an early stage now, and he was showing me some of the earliest things they're doing with, with jackfruit, which is not a new ingredient by any stretch, but how they plan to scale that up into both source as well as completed prepared products. I think you'll find this interesting. Please welcome Blair Crichton, CEO of Corona. Hi, I'm Blair, and I'm from Karana. We're recreating iconic Asian products to be still great tasting, but also healthy, plant-based, and sustainable. And we're doing this because of three major trends in Asia Pacific. First is the insatiable demand for meat and seafood in the region. Ooh, sorry. Um, and this is a region that is already the world's largest consumer of meat. Secondly, consumers in the region are increasingly affected by dietary-related health issues, such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and obesity. And as a result, they're looking for healthier options. And finally, consumers in the region are really concerned about where their food is coming from, and is it safe? Is the supply chain transparent? Now, of course, they're not willing to give up on taste and experience in order to meet, to solve some of these problems. So our solution, is this going forward? Yes, sorry. Our solution is to create the Asian whole-based plant, whole plant food brand of the future. Sorry, I don't know why these are skipping ahead. You're the one on the right there. There we are. Okay, um, and what we're looking to do is turn to what we see as the world's greatest technology, that is Mother Nature. Currently, we only consume about 150 out of 30,000 edible plant species. Now, that means there's this huge opportunity to go and explore what's in biodiversity and innovate around that. And so what we're looking to do is find those ingredients that are naturally meat-like and then enhance them with technology and improve them. So, Whilst at the core of our ingredient, we have whole plant, ingre whole plant ingredients, we're not scared of using technology to improve them. We have a number of research partnerships in place, looking at how we can leverage biotechnology and cell-based meat to improve these ingredients. Now, of course, we're not going to get there overnight. So what, we're, what we've been doing so far is we've built a supply chain of organic young jackfruit, which is the first product we're working with. We also have a pipeline of lots of other really interesting ingredients. This isn't an easy task, because the jack, while it is an abundantly available ingredient, the supply chains are very fragmented. But as many of you may know, I'm sure many of you have tasted jackfruit. It can be a great ingredient. But as a vegan, often I get excited because it looks like meat, but it isn't actually meaty. When you eat it, it doesn't quite have the right mouthfeel or the texture. But we know jackfruit can be improved and it can be amazing. So what we're working on right now is using proprietary processing methods to improve that texture and taste of jackfruit and to create a product that is easy to use and can just be put in the pan and cook like meat. And then use that as a base ingredient into ready-to-eat iconic Asian products, starting with dumplings and bows. 
In the future, we're looking at how we can further enhance these ingredients and leverage those biotech research partnerships that we have to create whole new categories of products, such as blended cell-based and plant-based ingredients. So to start with, we're going to market in food service. And restaurants are really excited about our products because it gives them something that is whole plant and minimally processed. And we've already built some great relationships with our beta product. And this is really important for us because it also allows us to build our brand, educate consumers, but most importantly, get great feedback from our restaurant partners in terms of how we can improve our product and feed that into our product development for our next generation products. So the team is led by myself and my co-founder, Dan. Dan has a background in agri-commodity supply chains in Asia Pacific, based out of Cambodia and working across the region. He then came to Columbia Business School here in the US and worked in the insect protein space. He quickly realized that the amount of capital needed to scale that industry was better spent on plant-based and cell-based meats, and so he founded Karana. Myself, I started my career in banking. I'm from Hong Kong and Cool Asia Home. I then came to the US and went to business school at Tuck, and after that, fully immersed myself in the plant-based industry, with stints at Impossible Foods, New Age Meats, and working with the Good Food Institute. We're both driven by a passion for sustainability and great food, and we've built a, a top team of advisors to help us achieve our mission, as well as some really great research partnerships. Currently, we're raising $1.5 million for our seed round, which of, of which about half of it is committed. So we're Karana, we're Natural Meats Innovation, and we're recreating icon iconic Asian products to be healthy, plant-based, and sustainable. Very good. That's it for Karana. I want to thank you for your, uh, your honesty about jackfruit. How many people here in the room have had a jackfruit meat substitute and everyone at the table kind of didn't want to admit that it kind of sucked? It's not always very good. And you are aware that this has a texture challenge in many cases. You want to push that forward. What is it about jackfruit that is worth all this investment and time to take it to the next level for, by your company? So there's a number of things. First, it is a very sustainable ingredient. Okay. It's, high, it's high yielding, it's climate resistant. It is also an ingredient that is very biodiverse. It's grown intercropped. Um, and also, it's an ingredient that is currently wasted. Most of the supply chain mm. is wasted. So it's also a chance to reduce food waste. And then going forward, you go beyond just that one ingredient and you start to diversify more. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, like I said, there's this huge untapped resource out there. And we've already explored a number of ingredients in our research pipeline, and uh, we'll be looking to bring them on board. But initially, we're focused on jackfruit. Uh, let me ask you about this uh, area of meat demand, especially you're talking about, uh, you referenced some of the Asian markets, for example, where you have a lot, of, uh, a lot of roots and a lot of understanding and experience. We've heard repeatedly already this morning about how developing markets will see meat differently and be a little, perhaps less open to replacing it because it's a sign of success, of arriving, mm -hmm. of social status. Yeah. What's your take on that with your understanding of different global markets? Yeah, so, I mean, that is a very fair point, and that is what is driving a lot of that 78% growth in meat and seafood demand that I had on my earlier slide. But as well, consumers in the region are increasingly concerned about their health. Look at China now. It's the world's biggest wellness market. And as a result, a lot of the wealthier middle, urban middle class are looking to actually change their diet now because they've already achieved that wealth. They, they don't need to keep on eating meat to show they're wealthy. They're now starting to think about how they look after their bodies. And social change and certainly social norm change really happens fast yeah. in that culture. I mean, there's an appetite for new, innovative social mores, it seems like, or at least around food and some other technologies. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. OK, very good. Thank you. Nice presentation. OK. All right, that's Karana and Blair Crichton. Okay, our final presenter, and uh, you'll enjoy this one, is Ecovative. I want you now to please welcome the Director of Marketing, Andy Bass. Thank you, good afternoon. So Ecovative was founded in 2007 and has been a successful R&D partner to some of the biggest brands in the world. 
We use mycelium, the root structure of mushrooms, to grow materials. And with our technology, we've created the holy grail of meat. And that's a bold statement, so let me explain. Oops. It's been fascinating to see the innovation and consumer excitement happening around plant-based meats. And while the focus has been on ground meats, we see an opportunity to apply our technology to create whole cut products. And the difference between ground and whole cut products is structure. And the importance of this is when you look at the USDA annual beef report from 2018, you see there was almost $80 billion of beef sold in the US last year. 88% of the beef sold were whole cuts, and this accounts for $64 billion, or 81% of the total value of the U.S. beef market. And the seafood market follows a similar pattern. In, in um, 80% of the total seafood sold in the U.S. in 2017 were whole cuts. So these data indicate a significant need to create whole cut products if we're going to meaningfully shift consumers away from traditional meat consumption. But in order to deliver plant-based and cell-based whole cuts of meat to the dinner table, structure is needed. And mushrooms are one possibility for structure. They're already sought after as a whole cut alternative. They're a natural, edible, food-safe ingredient that can be infused with fats and flavors. And as you can see from these images here, some mushroom varieties have strikingly similar characteristics to the meats they're so aptly named after. And not just in the way that they look, but in the way that they taste and their texture as well. So mushrooms are an ideal ingredient for structure, except for a few things, and these are the challenges. So existing mushroom cultivation techniques result in a mushroom geometry, and this isn't ideal if you're trying to create a steak and it looks like a mushroom. And also, many of, this, many of the strains that I showed on the previous slide are only available in the wild, so you have to go out and forage for these, which isn't commercially scalable. And finally, a lot of these mushrooms also have long growth cycles, anywhere from eight to 12 weeks, which isn't ideal for industrialization. So overcoming these three challenges is where we focused Ecovative's technology, and I'm excited to say that in a cost-efficient and scalable way, we've created the holy grail of meat, which is structure. So I'd like to introduce you to our newest platform focused on food called Atlas. And with Atlas, we're able to grow gourmet sheets of mycelium from these meat-like mushroom tissues that we find in nature. And the easiest way to describe this is that we've created programmable mushrooms. We can grow these meat-like mushroom tissues in gourmet sheets with various texture and, and, and structural combinations at commercial scale in just nine days. So in the next couple slides, I'll show you some of the first applications of our mycelium-based scaffolding. So in cell agriculture, we've shown that our mycelium scaffold is biocompatible across a broad range of species. Shown here are fibroblasts from bovine, avian, and salmon growing onto and into the mycelium scaffold. And for a plant-based meat proof of concept, we've infused fats and flavors into thin strips of mycelium to create a plant-based bacon. And the texture becomes crispy, just like bacon, and the most important part is it tastes great. So I recently asked our chef for a photo of a hero dish that I could share with you here today, and he made me this plant-based chicken sandwich. And I grew up in Alabama, we had Chick-fil-A's everywhere, so for lack of a better term, I call this the chick fil a <laughs> It features uh, a chicken of the woods cutlet as the filet portion, our Atlas bacon, and a vegan cheese. And you can see in the chicken of the woods portion the fiber alignment. And this is analogous to whole muscle tissue, which provides structure. To align you with Ecovative's business model, we're a technology company with a B2B focus. We tend to partner with leaders in a particular field who have a domain expertise, and we provide technology. We work in both exclusive and non-exclusive scenarios and have a strong IP portfolio. Today, we operate a 35,000 square foot facility in upstate New York, and we're led by our two founders, Eben Baer and Gavin McIntyre, and have a strong executive team. And we're announcing today, right now in fact, that we're spinning out Ecovative's food-based assets into a new company called Atlas Food Co. And we anticipate launching this new company in early 2020, and we're here today seeking strategic and institutional investors for Atlas Food Co., as well as leaders in this space who want to work with us to create what's next in whole cut foods. So uh, please feel free to reach out with questions, Come by our booth and say hello, and thank you very much for your attention. Great. Let's hear it for Andy.
All right, so to make sure we're clear, because you've given us some news now, uh, very clearly and succinctly contrast Ecovative from Atlas. Correct. So, um, so Ecovative is a technology company. It's a foundry where we have a lot of different applications from protective packaging to actually making vegan leather. Um, and we think it's important to, to dedicate our resources to these individual technologies and applications that are coming out of Ecovative. And so we grow mushrooms really well, but we're not experts in the food industry. And so uh, we're spinning out this new company to build that expertise within Atlas Food. Okay, Group. got it. Uh, let me ask you about seafood. Uh, we hear less about that than we hear about the other sorts of meats uh, so far and at this point in history. Seafood's very delicate. Uh, by, in most forms, it seems that there's less place to hide shortcomings in your process when you try to make seafood. Is that a pretty good read? Well, so we've actually, um, we, we've learned a lot through some mistakes, and um, we've actually gotten some weird looking uh, sheets of mycelium <laughs> that uh, actually grew in almost scalloped layers. And which is kind of akin to what you would see in seafood, where it almost flakes off. Yeah. And so while that was an error for what we were going for, it actually informed something that's potentially a, a, another product that could be focused in seafood. You are also telling me at your booth over in the expo area last night that this same technology can span to a thin strip of bacon, or a, you know, a steak cut, a piece of fish that's a little thinner, a piece of bacon even thinner, or a leather belt. How close are those? How akin are those teachers? Not that that's a go-to-market strategy for consumers, right. but how much of that uh, is really part of a continuum, or is there more of a reach to make those all akin? Well, so the, the, the unique base of that is the mycelium, and then where it differs is the strain that we use to make the product. So for food, we're using edible strains, um, which have, in some cases, chicken flavor or the texture of chicken, whereas for our leather applications, we're using a much more, a much tougher mushroom variety. I've been to some avant-garde restaurants in San Francisco. They're serving those in salads, let me tell you. <laughs> I'm still chewing one of those. Um, so there are mushrooms that really are not so edible, but are really workable. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So we, we started our business in 2007 in protective packaging. And so our idea was we wanted to obviate the need for styrofoam. And we were able to, uh, this was a composite, this is a composite part where we grow mycelium around agricultural waste. And rather than have the styrofoam corners on a TV box that you might get, mm -hmm. we can actually grow those. And you pitch them in your garden when you're done, they're gone in 30 days, back into the earth. All right, who knew? Mycelium, so many things going on here. And please uh, say thank you to Andy Bass from Ecovative. And now, Thank Atlas. you. Okay. Thank you. We started off with one company and he walks off with two. That's pretty good. All right, thank you very much. Um, please visit our six presenters here today. They're amongst those that are in the, uh, they're in the room when you come into the main lobby, down to the right, that's the Ralston room, and they're in that area all within a short walk. They've all got samples, I believe almost all of them do, and they're all quite tasty, and very interesting new innovators. I hope you got a glimpse of the future of where it could be going, you know, the next round of companies that could be lording over the industry a year or two from now at the Good Food Conference. Thank you very much, and we'll continue with the conference now.